I can just lead uh, for a second and, and give a quick overview of what I uh, was hoping to accomplish today and, and maybe spark some, some conversation. Um, the last two talks especially, we got a chance to uh, step out of the traditional uh, science research discipline that I operate in and try to think about what other uh, sociological uh, limits there are to making some differences in, in uh, both food and in environmental security in the world. And, you know, Melissa and her team gave a fantastic example of, of not only deploying agricultural uh, innovations and in, in new seeds and technology, but also uh, new economic practices and moving that uh, frontier from kind of spinning the uh, research circles uh, and preaching to the converted out to really engaging uh, with partnerships. And I think the, the CGR centers uh, both have um, you know, direct access to the fields and to the farmers, um, but are a good portal for uh, partnerships for, for, for research. And, and then Bob's trying to uh, that, uh, incorporate some of the ecosystem service values um, in part of our, our production stream. So in the slide you showed from Bill Foley where we're trying to not only optimize yield and um, maybe improve harvest index, so everything on that hectare of land is going right into grain. We can think about uh, biomass as, as having a value and incorporating um, some metrics from, from ecology and, and thinking about uh, not only goods that can be extracted, but services that flow through these fields. I think that's really important in the, in the small uh, shareholders in, in, um, in developing systems where roots uh, can, you know, perennial crops, for example, can, can sequester carbon and hold soil and, and improve fertility. So these additional values beyond just uh, yield and in, in even export commodities, but uh, services that improve um, water and carbon functioning of ecosystems. Those are new targets really for, for breeders and they might not be so far away from the wild varieties that, that we started with. So this might be a, a long way of sort of summarizing um, that traditional research focus has been improving yield in, uh, in the narrow sense of, of the food production sometimes at the expense of, of the environmental services. But going forward, as we hit these planetary limits in a full world, we not only have to produce more food, but we have to secure the environment. And that's where uh, I think agriculture can make a, a large contribution. And so maybe I'll leave it at that. We're gonna have these two mics going up, um, and I can, we have a few mics here as well, so. Does anyone want to start off? Thanks. I had a question for you, Paul, because I really like the idea of a finite globe with our resources um, underpinning the economic development. My question was on the, Bate, uh, the Bateman analysis of the United Kingdom, and I was wondering whether where the boundary was drawn for that consideration, because my understanding is that the UK has a huge water footprint that falls well outside the UK because it imports so much food. So, I mean, it's all very well to have a lovely environment for the UK residents, but what about the people of Africa where the, uh, the food's actually being produced? <laughs> That's a really good point. That's a very, very good point. I don't know if I need it. I'll just turn it off. Did I turn it off? How's that? Um, yeah, I, I'm not absolutely sure about that, but I think they probably ignored those uh, those imports, and I think that's all the more reason for doing these analyses at multiple scales, uh, because if you just focus on the small scale or even the intermediate scale, you're, you're sort of missing what's happening on these other scales, and, and often you can, uh, you can uh, <coughs> yeah, get the wrong the wrong answer. So that's uh, extremely important to do multi-scale analysis, and uh, as part of what we're proposing to do as part of this project that uh, Justin and I <coughs> other colleagues have just uh, sent in as a discovery grant. So how can we utilize a small scale you know, farm uh, uh, results, uh, but also scale those up to the whole country and the whole, uh, the whole planet. So, good point. Uh, I, 
yes, uh, you, you could actually equally um, translate that to nitrogen in, say, the Netherlands, and so they do exactly the same thing, massive imports of, of feed for you know, livestock. Uh, in, in the process, they, they have a good in quality of living in terms, in terms of GDP, but they also have a, a real problem in terms of nitrogen and nitrogen budget. So these aren't free transfers. Um, each of those transfers has consequences. And the reason why we do it is because, on, on balance, um, they uh, meet the needs of both parties at the time. So that's the basis of track. Except that you need to internalise all those external costs and benefits. And that's what I'm saying at the time, because yeah. you're not actually incorporating all those things. So as your knowledge improves and as your value set changes, then that, the equation changes as well. Gentlemen, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for being up on, um, on, on John's point. The, the terminology is virtual water and virtual resources. So that's, that's that concept's been going since 2005 or 2006. Um, Australia yet has not really become clear, but you've, you've obviously got something there with ecosystem services too, because the point that John's brought up. And as relevant to Australia, we export water because we're using our water resources, goes in crops, and then other countries get the benefit of it. But similarly, we have uh, an eco may have an ecological cost in our country to growing that food. But consequently, there's some sort of virtual transfer where the recipients don't bear that cost. I'm not sure what's going on. Given uh, the previous comments, I think. I mean, the ecologists really need to ask the question: Where? How are we going to feed the world? Where are we going to produce the food? If you want to lock it up for recreation in the UK or Switzerland, like they're going back to museum farming, uh, and any studies that don't look at the broader implications are a waste of time. They're basically a waste of time, I think. Ask the question: Where are you going to produce the food, and how? And if you're looking at greenhouse gas uh, potential, intensive agriculture actually has the lowest footprint in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas released per kilogram of food. Look at the numbers. Well, just to comment on that, I think that's, uh, I think making the same point that, uh, that we're making, you can't just look at the, the, uh, the natural system part of it, you can't just look at at agriculture and food production, I think you have to look at the whole system, and you have to also consider, you know, what what actually does contribute to well-being and sustainability. So it's a much more complicated um, <coughs> challenge, and it's certainly something that requires, you know, all academic or many academic disciplines to cooperate in ways that they haven't traditionally been doing. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's something we need to do a lot more of: is this more integrated systems-level analysis. Uh, so we can answer just that question. How can we produce the highest value, the highest quality of life and landscape that can support people in all the ways that they need to be supported, which is not just food production, but it, it certainly includes that. And it's not just you know, market-based market uh, consumption, uh, but it certainly includes that. But it also includes all these other things. So you've got to look at the whole picture and over multiple scales and, and over longer time periods. So I, I was just going to basically agree with Tony. I think, I think that um, a lot of the work out there is, is kind of missing these, these cross-scale interactions, and a lot of the work out there is probably guilty of, of just not fully appreciating how, how much of a moving target we have and how much historical success is no, by no means guaranteed going forward. So, so I think there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of things that increasing productivity doesn't take care of, and there's a lot of reasons um, to, to change the, our measures of productivity and change how we approach things. But it's important to maintain improvements in the high production areas. And I think one of the, one of the risks of focusing, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm absolutely sold on the need to really make progress in Africa, especially because it, as the soils kind of deteriorate, it gets harder and harder. But if all of our effort, kind of globally, I mean, this is a, a characterization here, but if, if a lot of the effort is focused on very low production systems at, at the potential expense of sacrificing progress in the high production systems. Um, 
it, it's not a good picture in terms of in terms of global productivity gains. It's, it's a, actually a pretty bad picture in terms of land use change because you're you're improving productivity in the areas that are are the most elastic in terms of their land use. So, just to reiterate, reiterate what Tony said, I mean, there's a lot of important decisions about um, accounting for sort of global impacts of, of making decisions locally that are restricting productivity gains, but also just in thinking about how how the moving target requires progress both at the low end but also at the high end. And, and I think um, I think it's important to, to not lose sight of how important continuing that past success is. One thing I wanted to add to that is, um, in some ways, it's a bit of a false choice to think that we have to do either uh, further intensification of the, the high value uh, commodity crops in the, the high value areas, or you know bring up the bottom in the, the most needy areas. I think in some ways the, the return on investment um, for certainly the, the public sector can be major gains in new crops that really haven't had any intensive breeding and also agronomic practices. So. In some ways, there might be a, a middle ground where we're not going to, you know, do advanced uh, genomic breeding on a hundred different species around the world for a lot of specialty areas, but we might be able to move out of the top five into the top fifteen crops. And, and we were talking about quinoa and amaranth, and maybe these next tier sort of uh, orphan crops, where um, you know a few million dollars of investment can lead to major gains in, in less than a decade. And, and that's where we can step outside of the traditional sort of elite plant breeding uh, institutions into these um, you know, seed centers of the world and, and start to work with farmers. The other thing is to, to do trials around the world in different areas, sort of to get outside of, of Iowa and, and Illinois and um, even South Australia and Victoria as, as kind of developed prime areas and try to make improvements in the, in the marginal lands. And that was kind of where this bioenergy crops, if, if that remains for a while, like they're, they don't want to compete with food, so they're going to be planted in the, in the marginal lands. And hopefully we move to more of a, a restoration of ecosystem services than a further extraction of, of, of biomass for energy and just bank that biomass in the ground. But that still requires sort of uh, intermediate reversion to um, semi-wild uh, and restoration type of, of crops that are going to be more climate ready and resilient. And it might not be reflective of the original landscapes that were there. We're kind of at a time where whole ecosystems are changing and they're becoming more agro-ecosystems. So uh, if we're going to breed for not only food but for environmental services, then there's just a lot of room for progress in, in the near term if we open the portfolio a little bit. Um, just to jump in before Eric does, while we're on the same tack, um, I just want to support what you said. I mean, the, the approach of ACR is twofold. It's very much agricultural intensification, but it's also agricultural diversification. And, our problems are so complex, we need a range of solutions. And, um, and and they're not mutually exclusive. So a lot of the research that we're doing in diversification is actually increasing the yields of the five staple crops at the same time. And early on when you were introducing this session, Justin, you talked about what we're targeting. And I think one of the things that we need to put on the table that we have to target is micronutrients because of the nutritional problems that the developing and developed world is up against right now. Now, we call it the double burden. You've got huge countries dealing with the effects of undernutrition and the cognitive impacts that's having on their communities, which means they're not productive and it's just further developing the poverty cycle. And then you've got countries in the developed world which are dealing with overnutrition and the huge costs to our society of dealing with non-communicable diseases, which is apparently the greatest cost in terms of medical terms that we're currently facing. So um, agricultural diversification holds the key to that. And, we're, and, and the medical community is, is recognizing that, the agricultural community is recognizing it, and they're coming together to discuss you know, non-pharmaceutical 
um, options to deal with nutrition. So it's not one or the other. We have to have a range of options ahead of us if we're going to deal with the challenges. So I'd just like to make a, a small number of comments about, about all this. Uh, one to follow on on Tony is that there is now um, an increasing uh, attempt to make access to food a human right. And so, for example, uh, the Indian government has now taken the step to say that access to food is an entitlement for the entire population. Now, um, if the, the price of food or the value of growing crop is less than the ecosystem services of that same land, how are those poor people going to fit into a market system to make sure their entitlements are delivered? So how are you going to put those market values in a, in a way that recognize that some people with no market power have the right to some uh, use of the land for their own purpose? Um, the, um, you know, I, I just <laughs> Well, if I could respond to that, I don't, uh, <coughs> um, it's not an either or proposition. I mean, I think the challenge is designing agroecosystems that, that produce a better, a better balance of all of the services that, that humans value uh, coming off of the landscape. And uh, part of that could be encouraged with economic incentives. So we can you know, pay farmers for producing not just crops, but for, for other services. And that, that can help to, to <coughs> change the, the balance and the, and the incentives in the appropriate way. So there's, there's all kinds of um, and, you know, interesting institutional design uh, challenges here as well. Uh, and <coughs> both, uh, you know, there's systems design challenges. How do you come up with landscapes that really are uh, more valuable overall in a comprehensive way, more sustainable, uh, but also how do you change the institutions to make it, to make it happen? And the second one is bigger than the first one, probably. Yeah, well, <laughs> they're both important. <laughs> And I think we have to do them both simultaneously. Part of the, the way of doing that is to engage the stakeholders in the design process, both, uh, both the, the system design and the institutional design. And, you know, that's been shown over and over again that that's the only way to really get sustainable uh, solu uh, institutions to happen as well. You're probably familiar with uh, Eleanor Ostrom's work on governing the commons and, and the fact that you, you know, if you don't engage the, the stakeholders in the design of the rules and norms and, and et cetera, your chances of uh, having them actually work are, are much reduced, or at least much more expensive to enforce. A couple of questions leading off uh, some of the comments uh, made so far. Uh, the first one is um, on the demand side, and um, recognizing that we've we've been talking about increasing supply and yield and so on. Is there a case for uh, altering the mix of, um, of, of human food consumption? Um, in other words, is there a, are we pricing protein at, at, a, at, a, at an economically sustainable level? And what else might we do to you know, remove the demand or, or manage the demand for uh, increased crop production? It's the first question. Um, the second question is, what are the specific options where farmers can be paid for ecosystem service, services or management that, that are working in, in other uh, countries? Well, to the first one, I would argue that the, the prices of everything are, uh, are wrong. You know, the, the, because the, the magnitude of the externalities in the system today are so large, uh, we're not incorporating all of those external costs and energy production and food production, you know, probably uh, <coughs> uh, you know, in terms of protein for sure. So if we actually paid the true cost of the things that we're, we're consuming, uh, I think things would look very different and we'd be headed in a much more sustainable way. And there certainly are efforts to try to estimate what those external costs are, how big are they. Um, <coughs> I'm involved with a company out of the UK called True Cost that, that does just that for all the major traded companies in the world. You find that, you know, it's just uh, it, the, the current prices are, are way off. And you can't expect the market to give you any sort of efficient solution in the face of <coughs> that, those large externalities. You have to do something uh, about it one way or the other. Um, <coughs> what was the second question you had? How do farmers get paid? Well, I think. Um, Costa Rica might be the, the, the sort of um, poster child of the 
use of payment for ecosystem services, where they pay farmers uh, <coughs> basically the opportunity costs to convert from cattle ranching to, uh, to planting forests, because cattle ranching, in the way they had done it there, was compacting the soil, leading to you know, uh, uh <coughs> runoff of water and, and nutrients, et cetera. And so it was having a big impact on the ecosystem services. And by paying them more than they could make by raising cattle to plant, to plant trees, they managed to reforest uh, the country, essentially. Um, that's one case. There's many other examples of these payment systems that are, are kind of in you know, a state of uh, experimentation, I would say, in design around the world. Uh, one argument, though, I would make is that <clears throat> I don't think it's a simple market mechanism that you're, you're actually shooting for. I think it's, it's a little more complex, and we probably need, to, need to, um, uh, <clears throat> different institutions to manage these services because they're not private goods, they're public goods. And uh, so one idea is to have common asset trusts where the, the ownership of the resource is held in common. And that trust then can you know, pay uh, individuals for, for enhancing the asset. And they could ch also charge individuals for uh, depleting the asset. Uh, so some you know, more radical institutional designs, I think, can, uh, can really help uh, to, to move forward. You might also not, might not want to pay individuals for uh, producing those services, but pay you know uh, the community in some in some way, enhance uh, enhance their welfare, but not not by uh, paying individuals directly. So there's a I think a lot of um, design work that needs to go on, a lot of experimentation in this that will, that will hopefully maybe some of that can happen here in Australia. Jill has a question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Um, just following on from Melissa. Just following on from Melissa's um, points about expanding the, the research by the way from the researchers to, to their end users and involving social scientists and that, one of the main benefits, major areas that needs addressing in there is risk management. Because risk management is not only a, a barrier to adoption, but it's also a cause of a lot of environmental impacts. I was just reflecting while you were talking, I, I, I'm lucky to work with a very diverse group of farmers. I work with some very wealthy farmers, some of the wealthiest farmers on the planet and some of the poorest. I work with some cotton farmers in Australia. Now their nitrogen management is such that what they're managing for is that they have a particular amount of water per year, they don't want nitrogen to be an issue. So they apply much more nitrogen than is what is necessary in order that that is not a risk. Um, there are obvious offside effects of that, but it's also a major producer of nitrous oxide, which is 14 times whatever it is um, as a greenhouse gas. The use of fossil fuel in creating the nitrogen in the first place. Now, I also work with the other end of the farmers, some very poor upland farmers in, in the Philippines. Um, they don't use fertilizer at all. That equally has hugely deleterious effects because they are now in a cycle of declining fertility. They're, they're ex they've exported um, fertility nutrients from their soil for however long since it's been cleared, and they're now getting to a stage where they cannot get a cr an economic crop. Um, and so they abandon the land and it becomes some rather grassland. Now, they can't, the problem there is simply risk. They cannot afford to get credit in order to buy the fertilizer to get themselves out of that spiral of declining fertility. So in both cases, you've got problems created by risk, where you're managing for short-term risk, but it's having long-term implications. Well, um, yeah, I was quickly, I guess, trying to make that point at the end of my talk with, with one of the challenges as, as production gets riskier in a lot of areas is that you, you either lead to more environmental damage or you lead to underinvestment or, or low investment in these inputs. I mean, I, I should say that I'm generally optimistic on nutrient management. I think there's a lot of improvements and, uh, and uh, um, you know, in the case of Africa, there's a lot of innovative strategies to try to transfer some of that risk or deal with some of that risk. And in, on the high end, there's some strategies to try to um, be more responsive in the in the fertilizer use so that you are not over way over applying in, uh, in in down years. So 
So I, I agree with you, but I also am optimistic in general on the technology development on that front, or, and not just the, you know, the physical technology, but a lot of the business models and the insurance schemes and stuff. Um, yeah, I guess some more comments in support. That's definitely front and centre, and um, as David said, there's quite a lot of innovative things happening to try and deal with risk, because when you're living on the edge like that, you've got zero resilience. So it's not just that you're having environmental damage, but there's human catastrophe and crises happening too. So it's really about um, helping the farmers improve their appetite or ability to, to handle risk and build some resilience so that when a crisis comes or, or poor season or whatever, you're not, you're not um, moving into sort of humanitarian support. And one example is, um, and we talked about it this morning, um, for really poor pastoralists in, you know, Kenya and Tanzania, um, um, livestock insurance schemes, um, crop insurance schemes, and I'm talking for really, really poor farmers, but it allows them, it allows to build some capacity for them to cope with at least one bad thing that happens in their family, one bad season, you know, a death in the family, whatever, which ultimately benefits everybody in the long run. So it's really about slowly, I mean, you can never re reduce risk, but if you can improve the resilience, then you can at least improve their ability to respond to that. Another area that we're looking to export is the sort of idea of social capital that, that we are familiar with in Australia through the Landcare Movement, where you're building human and social capital to deal with, in Australia, NRM issues. But we're looking to use it in Africa, or well, it's being well used in Africa, to look at market access and getting into the production system and being able to have access to credit and seeds and inputs and, and outputs at the same time. So rather than operating in isolation, these farmers are coming together in, as groups or um, I, I, sometimes they're called Lanka groups, sometimes they're not, but again, it's about sharing the risk. Can I kind of bring together <coughs> two things? And uh, in your talk, I think you put up the was uh, Carberry and Keating that three three trajectory plot that you had. What was that? Okay, so um, that would be better if that was a three dimensional plot, and the, with the third dimension being some sustainability index, ecological damage index, ecosystem services. Index because if a policy person or a government person looks at that, they'll look at the one that's going like the European and say, Well, that looks good. And if they look at the one going like that, they'll say, Well, that doesn't look good. Uh, but on this one, as a, a measure of the ecological footprint or the sustainability of that, then you know it's not a, it's a misleading uh, diagram. You didn't give an opinion of that um, plot. It's not actually your plot. Yeah. I actually did in my presentation. I said um, you could argue that this should have other dimensions to it, and I, and I expressed the view that you know, it could have a sort of a conservation dimension, and, uh, and and so that was why I said this is a very simplistic uh, representation of the, the issue. Uh, but to actually populate those other dimensions, you actually need some information. And what I said was, I don't think we have the information at the moment That's to right. provide that. That's the problem. We don't have the information. <coughs> Someone gets left out of the argument. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll just add to that. Um, you know, it's not just and I was especially pleased to see that you're going to be looking at natural variation. Uh, and it occurs to me that one interesting area which would tie you into, into Justice's comments is the fact that we don't have any C4 dicot crops of any consequence around the world. That would be a nice one for somebody to target, like one of the amaranth species. But my, my question was, uh, the holy grail is variation in transpiration efficiency, which is linked to variation in Pmax, positively, not negatively, like we see, for example, within wheat and within many other species. Are you aware of any natural variation within a species whereby 
there's a positive correlation between translation efficiency at the leaf level and Pmax. I'm not aware of any particular examples of that in, within looking at cultivars. I mean, where you'd expect them to find them is, is potentially under environmental conditions. If we're talking about C3 plants as opposed yes. to C4 plants, um, in species adapted to hot dry environments where they've had to cope with very, di very different um, relationships that they need to establish, that if you took those plants and, and looked at them under more messy conditions, they may operate with higher uh, transpiration efficiency and higher photosynthetic efficiency. But I don't think that level of sophistication has, has been done uh, in terms of, of looking for that. I hope you can do it. <laughs> well, I need to talk to Graham about that. So. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, can you do any more? Can you hear me? No. I must say I've been tremendously stimulated by all the things that have been said here and a bit sort of overwhelmed by the, all the possibilities and you know, where it's going, sort of an exploding type of system of ideas. But I think there's just two ideas I'd contribute that, um, and there's a question behind this, but uh, one is there's a perspective missing here, I think, and that is a legal perspective. Um, uh, you can have laws that um, are you know, mandatorily enforced, or you can have laws that rely a lot on voluntary compliance. And I'm really thinking about voluntary compliance here. That a central problem is, is how you marshal all these ideas, all these disparate, they appear to be disparate sorts of uh, approaches, to the end of food security and you know, just guaranteeing there's enough food around for the people on the planet and that the environment is not being run down. Um, I think there's um, a, a good opportunity to formulate ideas under the, under the heading of, a, of an act. I think it could be called something like the Regional Sustainability and Social Equity Act. Now, if you, I don't know, it doesn't look like a legal audience, but <laughs> if you know how legislation works, um, you would find that these are an amazing, sort of amazing ideas that are working to certain purposes. You know, and they have sections and they set up things like this, um, we're talking about institutional things. So I think that um, there's a question here, it was about anybody doing any inquiry or research on the sort of legal framework in the ideal situation um, that would work towards the ends of food security and environmental protection. So that's one question. And the second um, idea to volunteer is that, again, it's not really being talked about here, is that all of this um, good knowledge, useful advice, guidance, confidence building, carrying forward historical knowledge has got to be delivered through people, through persons that impress other persons um, in some sort of um, you know, professional client transaction. So what I don't hear a lot of, um, in fact I haven't heard any at all, is about the central need to secure, to, for the strategy to achieve food security and environmental protection is the need for a professional, a new occupational role called a sustainability practitioner, where you take all of these things we've been talked about and they become formulated into like a clinical practice. You know, in particular areas you can have you know, wetland advice, you can have dry land advice, you can have um, on, the on the model of, for example, a, um, in medicine, you know, all the colleges of medicine, all the, um, you know, the focus on practice. And that the next evolutionary step, um, I suppose, in dealing with all this knowledge is to have an empowered practitioner, just like in medicine, you know, it took them many centuries to start to, to think, oh, okay, there has to be somebody here whose advice that we rely upon, and it becomes a social institution, and it becomes protected within society, and you've got disciplinary bodies to make sure you toe the line, all that sort of stuff. That um, these, this should be 
uh, and again, it comes back to the question, is anybody considering research in the training of sustainability practitioners <coughs> and, and the sort of social institution that they would fit in? Well, I would, I would argue that they do exist. Uh, there are institutes and schools you know, existence that train sustainability practitioners. The, the key word left out of that is empower sustainability practitioners. So, um, you know, having having those sorts of uh, services taken advantage of uh, toward, toward the ultimate goals, and maybe that's that's uh, more dependent on the first question, which is the, the legal framework uh, within which for this to happen. Um, I just reviewed a book um, by. Um, Mary Wood at Oregon, the University of Oregon, called Nature's Trust. Uh, it's a new legal framework for the, for the new ecological age, if you will. And it's based on this idea of the public trust doctrine. And uh, that doctrine goes back to, to Roman times. And it's been applied to open water and, and, uh, and beaches in some areas. But her argument is it needs to be applied much more broadly to, to all of our common assets, the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, certain uh, ecosystem services. And uh, <clears throat> that it's the government's responsibility to protect those assets for private use, for public use, and they, and they uh, cannot be uh, privatized, you know, or, or deeded to, to private interests. And I think that's that's part of the problem. Where you know, the atmosphere is, is now being managed as an open access resource, and so is much of the ocean. So we really want to get a handle on those things. We can't allow them to be open access resources any longer. They have to be. Have to have property rights, but those property rights have to be assigned to the community rather than, than uh, private individuals. Um, <clears throat> there's actually some some uh, some real movement in that regard. The state of Vermont has a bill that was pending the last time I looked called the Vermont Common Asset Trust uh, legislation. So there is there is some uh, some <clears throat> actual movement in that direction to create legal mechanisms uh, to to implement those kinds of ideas. You know I. I just think one, one area to be aware of, it's not illegal in development, but there's a lot of certification schemes, um, in many cases driven by market demand or, or driven by the private sector kind of anticipating, um, for example, with the, the soybean case in Brazil and the, the pressures to avoid deforestation. So there's lots of pretty strict certification schemes in place. Sometimes you could argue that they're not targeting the exact right properties, but sometimes they are, and that's, I think, a a positive development, but not, not quite what you're talking about. And then I would just say that most good agronomists would consider themselves a sustainability practitioner and that, and that they are advocating for um, you know, improving soil quality, rotating crops, all, all of the things that we often talk about in terms of um, sustaining the agricultural base, not usually valuing some of the non-market goods, but sometimes even, even those are, are brought into the picture, but it's not yeah, I think there's actually quite a, a large literature around on this, but it's quite dispersed. So you know, and it's called different things in different places, like adaptive governance literature, etc., which comes out of, of uh, Ostrom's work amongst others. But but in terms of, of examples, which perhaps are, are government led, and then they don't quite match what you're asking after. But um, for example, our CMAs that we used to have and sort of still do in some places now, you know, have that job of integration of production and conservation within those bounds uh, and, and setting targets for those. Uh, in the US there was the Conservation Reserve Program which uh, for a long time actually seemed to be pretty effective in terms of putting aside uh, cropland and, uh, and putting it under sort of conservation management uh, but that required continued government funding so as long as the government kept on topping up the, the funding bucket that was fine and as David just said is that when the price of corn you know, maize went up for biofuels you know, people started trading out of the conservation back into production uh, and another one would be the euro system where they've got stewardship payments etc um, so there's a combination of production and environmental uh, elements there that come into that again requiring top ups from the public purse and then along the lines of what David was just talking about with the certification, you've got the sort of private industry uh, um, footprint type uh, schemes like Tesco's and other supermarkets in, in the UK where, where they effectively try to inform the purchaser about what goes into that product uh, and, and hopefully that they'll actually make better decisions which end up with a lower footprint in the shopping basket. I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, 
So far, I think it's, uh, your focus is more production level. I, I know the information about the waste. And waste. I, actually, when I saw the um, huge amount of bread was dumped in the garbage bin because you can't sell in Australia because the food is there. Uh, what's it called? No, no, high any food standard. Say public safety reason you can't sell next morning, so they have to stop. I was so shocked to see it. They actually stopped the whole uh, garbage bin. That's illegal. Apparently, you have to go to different channel. And also, when I walking down the town hall uh, last week, uh, the huge amount of food you know, from takeaway shop they just live outside. So hopefully, homeless people picked it up. Huge amount is wasted, and I think there is a good way maybe you know to, to tackle this waste. And also, uh, another one is I found with the diet, because huge amount of uh, food is, you know, like, for example, Aboriginal people, Indigenous people have their own diet. No longer they eat that those food. Now, now they move to the Western diet. So I think, uh, so you know, there were a lot of road killing if you travel around the, uh, Australia. Huge amount of food is waste from my point of view. <laughs> And uh, so I think, it, you know, the way we can educate people eating diversity of food. Well, this gets back to the meat demand question as well. And I think uh, there's lots of interesting questions around protein. It's important to remember that most of the demand increase is, is from the emerging economies, where at least personally, it's very hard to see them not wanting to transition to higher meat diets. But, but I do think there are opportunities in the, in the rich world for reducing, because of health concerns or just other concerns, uh, reducing meat consumption and then much better you know, technologies to avoid waste like you're talking about. And there, are, at least in the US, there are lots of kind of second harvest operations um, that, that, are, that are already large but, but continue to grow in terms of trying to um, make sure you, you don't have over, over cons overly conservative food safety laws that prevent, you know, obvious uh, transfers within communities. Yeah, I think there are huge opportunities for reducing weight food waste, but the other issue we didn't really touch on is the whole distribution issue. Not only the distribution of food, but the dis distribution of, of wealth uh, in general, which uh, you know, has gotten really out of hand in, in some countries. But their wealth distribution is so unequal that it's really having a, a deleterious effect on um, social capital, which is having a, a deleterious effect on human well-being going forward, and sustainability, and also uh, the kinds of policies that we, that we pursue. So all these things are, are interconnected quite, uh, quite heavily, and uh, we have to bring in those sorts of considerations as well. You know? So it's not just increasing production, it's how it's distributed, how it's used more efficiently, you know, how equitably it's distributed around the planet. We can certainly make huge improvements in, in all of those. Um, I suppose following on from that talk about, the, uh, about food wastage, I suppose the other big dimension of food wastage comes in the distribution, um, a global food supply chain. And I suppose my question for the panel is, has there any work been done on modeling um, what sort of system would give uh, less food wastage in the distribution stage, whether it's a regional and local food production and consumption versus a globalised food production system? Um, I can say that f food waste, whether it be pre-harvest, post-harvest, or you know, well down the value chain to where the consumer's in charge of it, there's been quite a lot of work trying to quantify the cost of that. And I mean, the costs are just outrageous, when, when, even when you just look at one or two commodities. I mean, a really conservative estimate is 30% on average along the value chain from you know, production, uh, from harvest all the way along. And it depends where you are in the world, whether that's predominantly post-harvest, where you've got inferior storage options, storage and transport options, or in a more developed country, it's at a consumer level. Um, there's been quite a bit of work and research being done at the post-harvest level in a lot of countries and, and looking at at the sort of regional food value chains. I don't know that there's a huge amount being done at the developed 
world. Um, but, you know, we're talking profits and we're talking food security. So there's some pretty strong drivers behind that. All right, let's just all